He says the mystery of the Vedas and the mysteries I have and other mysteries I have explained. I have con- collected the Puranas and composed their history. The essence of the Puranas and account of yoga, rules for the religious novice, dimensions of the earth, sun and moon, and of the planet, stars and constellations. Nyaya, the sign of human orthopathy, pathology, charity, Pasupata Shastra, on and on. There is about ten verses, right? I haven't listed everything here, but the important thing is this is an enormous. Uh, compilation of knowledge, basically. Right? Look at all the sciences that are being addressed here. He re-emphasizes the Vedas, and he says he talks about the mysteries of the Vedas that he clarifies. And again, the two things that are um, not mentioned are the Pandavas, the Kauravas, or the um, rivalry or the battle between them. So, if we look at these these couple of verses that describe the Mahabharata. it looks like it's basically a vast compendium of knowledge which is wrapped around the story of rival cousins however the the story of the rivalry between the cousins is so fascinating that it leaves very little room in our imagination to engage with all the rest that the mahabharata has to offer and uh, in today's session we'll try and do some of that <laughs> hello everyone and welcome to this session of sangam talks and uh, thanks to all of you for making the time today to attend the session really um, i really appreciate your taking some time out the topic today of the session is the cosmology of the itihasa purana and we will look at stories of the sun and the moon so very brief overview of the talk right so we'll i'll have a brief introduction where we'll talk very briefly about the puranas mahabharata and most importantly about the framework of the discussion today so how are we going to talk about these and then we'll talk about stories and passages about the sun and we'll look at it in some detail uh, we'll look at stories relating to the moon and uh, it'll be a short overview just in the interest of time right we have a, a lot of time that we that i need to speak to be a very brief summary and then uh, if, if should there be any q and a i'd be happy to do my best to to answer so a quick introduction to the puranas the sanskrit word purana actually means ancient right and so puranas describe events deep within the earth's past and there are 18 mahapuranas and upapuranas that consist of over 400000 verses and uh, they are understood to be understood to be compiled by maharshi vyasa and they are conservatively dated to between 500 to 1500 ad though many scholars put it a lot earlier and it is considered the largest collection of mythology in the world right and it covers many different topics so it's almost encyclopedic in its nature and uh, for the session today we will be using an english translation of the puranas and this translation is by a board of scholars right so the government of india in the 1950s uh, put a team together like a team of scholars together to uh, to translate the puranas into english and then bring them out to the world so uh, very eminent people f- at that time and some of these translations have also been adopted by unesco so uh, so high quality of translation uh, as far as uh, the text is concerned a few words on the mahabharata also by maharshi vyasa and this is considered the longest poem ever written right um, and uh, it's about 100000 verses including a text called the harivamsa and the harivamsa is something of um, like a supplementary text to the mahabharata uh, it's not one of the parvas of the mahabharata it's a separate text right and but the two together is about about 100000 verses and the mahabharata is epic history so it is itihasa which means which stands for so it was and here it's unique because the narrator is a part of the story so generally history is written by people from a different country from a different time you know completely unrelated here the narrator is a part of the story so uh, maharshi vyasa is a part of the story and so he's in the same place at the same time and a participant in the in the narrative so it's quite fascinating from that perspective and as we know it describes the rivalry between the cousins the kauravas and the pandavas and i've used a couple of translations here i've used one by manmathana datta which is over 100 years old Uh, Ramesh Menon, Vivek Dev Roy, Professor Lal, and uh, um, obviously, I mean, the translations are not different, right? They are all translating the same text. But it's useful to remember that the um, Mahabharata is is a hundred thousand verses, so choice of words for a specific verse can differ between the 
uh, between the various translations, and I've chosen the one that I thought fitted the um, fitted the presentation, which brought out the depth of the verse best. And uh, obviously, there's no real difference between the between the various texts. So the Itihasa Purana refers to these two texts. It refers to the Mahabharata and the Puranas, the Purana Samhita, and the two together are called are often referred to as the fifth Veda. Right. Um, so the Padma Purana actually calls them, refers to them as the fifth Veda, and a couple of others as well. So uh, let's begin with the Mahabharata and how it is widely understood. And I am going to start with a quote from the Wikipedia. Now, if you look at the Wikipedia page on Mahabharata, it says the Mahabharata was one of the two major Sanskrit epics uh, of ancient India. It narrates the struggle between two groups of cousins in the Kurukshetra war and the fate of the Kauravas and the Pandava, Kaurava and the Pandava princes and so on. And then it goes on to say it also comes contains philosophical and devotional materials, such as the discussion of the pur, of the four goals of life or Purushartha. Now, Wikipedia is often, people feel that it is a Western view of, of knowledge, basically. But if you looked at um, Indian authors who translated the Mahabharata, or even some government of India websites, you wouldn't find anything that is dramatically, significantly different than this. Now, let's see what Maharshi Vyasa himself says about the Mahabharata. And uh, this verse is from the Bhagavata Purana, right? So um, before I actually go into the verse, let me kind of orientate you how I present each verse. So each one will have the source text, like the Bhagavata Purana. It will talk about the book, the chapter, and the translator. So the BOS, the Board of Scholars. And then it will give you the verse number. So suppose somebody um, after the presentation wants to go back and read up the whole thing so that they get a context of what was presented earlier, what was written earlier, and what was written later. It's very easy to do so, right? So you can find the words very easily uh, in the text. The second thing you'll notice is you'll see some um, words in parentheses here, meaning, subject, uh, and so on. I just want to emphasize that I have added nothing into this translation. All of these are by the translators themselves. So the people that have done carried out the translation have added these to make sure that um, they can clarify what is being said. I have, however, highlighted a few words for the purpose of the presentation so that I can focus on a few things. And in some cases, I've also deleted a few words because some of these verses are quite complex and they have different contexts. Each may, they have multiple different contexts. And, um, you know, so I just want to focus on what we're going to talk about today rather than everything that the verse says. So let's get into the verse. It says, and verily the meaning of the Vedas has been explained by compiling a work of the title Bharata, uh, in which subjects such as religions and others are known by underprivileged persons. So this is interesting. So uh, Maharishi Vyasa writes the Mahabharata to explain the meaning of the Vedas. And he says that there are a lot of people that don't have, physically may not have access to the Vedas. And I want to make sure I, they learn about the Vedas from this. And it also simplifies the Vedas right, by underprivileged persons. People may not be well-read enough to understand the Vedas. So this is, um, uh, so this will help them understand it better. Let's look at one of the words, right? And so what is interesting is there is no mention of the Kauravas and the Pandavas here. So just, just to call that out. This is a verse from the Adi Parva, and here Maharishi Vyasa is addressing Brahma. He's actually asking Brahma for help in writing down in Mahabharata, and this is how it goes. And he's, he's describing his poem to Brahma, and he says, The mystery of the Vedas and the mysteries I have, and other mysteries I have explained, I have collected the Puranas and composed their history. The essence of the Puranas and account of yoga, rules for the religious novice, dimensions of the earth, sun, and moon and of the planet stars and constellations, Nyaya, the sign of human or T.O.P., pathology, charity, Pasupata Shastra, on and on. There's about 10 verses, right? I haven't listed everything here. But the important thing is, this is an enormous uh, compilation of knowledge, basically. Right? Look at all the sciences that are being addressed here. He re-emphasizes the Vedas, and he says he talks about the mysteries of the Vedas that he clarifies. And again, the two things that are um, not mentioned are the Pandavas, the Kauravas, or the um, rivalry or the battle between them. So if we look at these, these couple of verses that describe the Mahabharata, it looks like it's basically a vast compendium of knowledge which is wrapped around the story of rival cousins. However, the, the story of the rivalry between the cousins is so fascinating 
that it leaves very little room in our imagination to engage with all the rest that the Mahabharata has to offer. And uh, in today's session, we'll try and do some of that. So I've highlighted a couple of things. I've highlighted the essence of the Puranas and the sun and the moon, and that brings me to the structure of the talk today. So we'll examine stories or passages from these texts, and they relate to the sun and moon. And there is no reference to the Kurukshetra war or to the Kauravas and the Pandavas, right? And each of these stories is explored in three parts. We will begin with the science for context. Then we'll have the story for the Mahabharata, and then we'll have the Puranas for details. So remember, the Mahabharata is the concise form of the Puranas, right, as we saw earlier. So with that in perspective, we'll start with the uh, sun. So very uh, quick introduction to the sun. Um, the sun is the host star for our solar system, and it's uh, over 90% of it is hydrogen, and the rest is mostly helium. And it consists of two significant layers, a core, which is a very high temperature and pressure, where uh, hydrogen nuclei fuse to form helium. And then there is a shell where energy is transmitted outward. So the, I've kept the science part as simple as possible, but it's useful to have this context so that you can follow what the texts have to say. I've said there are two, two layers. There are other layers like the photosphere, the chromosphere, and so on, but they are of no interest to our discussion today. So we'll just kind of move on. And the sun is like any star in the universe, right? And uh, like a star, it has a life cycle of five stages. Uh, it has a stage of birth, the stage of a young star. Uh, surprisingly, stars have a youth stage of youth, right? It's hard to believe, yeah? Uh, there is a stage of a mature star, which is the sun that we see in the skies today. Uh, and this is expected to last for about 7 billion years, so plenty of time ahead of us, right? And then it becomes what is called a red giant, and then it becomes a white dwarf, which basically signifies the beginning of the death of the star. So we'll begin with the first stage, which is the birth. And um, the most widely accepted model for star formation is called the nebula hypothesis. And according to this, stars form in giant clouds of hydrogen called giant molecular clouds. And they are named after the constellation that they are found in. So here we see a picture of the Orion molecular cloud. And uh, it's a basically a huge cloud of gas and dust. And you can see the um, three stars of Orion's belt in the center. Right? So it's, uh, it's, it's located there. And these are like hundreds, these are giant, like these are hundreds of light years across. So it's, these are huge uh, areas of uh, space. And these can stay unchanged uh, for long periods of time and some perturbation initiates star formation. And so what, what happens in star formation is this, some molecules of hydrogen and some particles of gas start to come together, uh, actually pulled by their own gravity and they form a big ball of, big ball of gas. So at this stage, it is what is called a protostar. It's not yet a fully formed star. Um, and at this stage, it emits neither heat nor light. So it's just a big ball of gas. So let's see what the uh, Mahabharata says about it, right? And this is um, these are verses from the passage in the Harivamsa. Like I said, the Harivamsa is a companion text to the Mahabharata, right? So we can read the two of them together as one complete corpus, right? And uh, there it says, um, in chapter 9, it says, Kasyapa begat uh, Vivaswan on Aditi, the daughter of Daksha. Then after a couple of verses, it says, Kasyapa affectionately said to Aditi, who was ignorant, your embryo is not dead. So he's called Martanda. Now, it's two verses, kind of hard to make out what's being said here. So let's look at what the Brahmanda Purana says about this. And like I said, these are from the Brahmanda Purana, and this is about the birth of Martanda. So it's useful to understand that the birth of in because these texts are a couple of thousand years old, they are speaking to an audience at that time. And so you can see that the sun has been personified as the sun god, and the moon will be personified as the moon god, and so on and so forth. Right. And so that's it's just, just useful to understand. And the Brahmanda Purana says in the beginning, the holy lord created an egg within her belly, which is Aditi's belly. And when it was taken out of the belly, it resembled a dead lump. And since he was born Mrita and as an egg under, Savitra, the son, is called Martanda by the learned men. So uh, the Sandhi of the words Mrita and Anda is Martanda. And that is how the son is born. So if you look at the summary of the text, it talks about the birth of the son. It says Anda is a spherical ball of gas. And Mrita means it is dead or inert. It's not generating any heat or light. And uh, this is very similar to the description of a protostar. So is that a, just a coincidence 
Well, maybe it is, yeah? So let's move on and see what else we have. And so we get to the next stage, which is the young star, and we also talk about its transition to the mature stage. So now this protostar, which is just a big ball of gas, it continues to collapse and it emits initially it, as the molecules get closer to uh, molecules of gas and thus get closer to each other. Initially, they emit heat and then they emit light, right? And, the, and this, this ball of gas is, becomes very bright and it's extremely active. So when I'm saying active, it's basically characterized by flares that are a thousand times larger than the solar flares that we see today. So rem remember when we see the, when we have a solar, giant solar flare from the sun, even though the earth is very far away, it's like 150 million kilometers, the solar flare can stop can impact communications on, on our planet and sometimes impacts power lines when it's very powerful. And this is a thousand times larger. And just to give you an idea, this is a, a set of two T Tauri stars, like a binary T Tauri star, T Tauri north and south. And just look at the size of the jets that come out from here, right? You can see this huge jet here, this huge jet here. This is a picture uh, from the Institute of Astronomy here. Yeah? And so you can see that these are these giant jets of gas that come out of the sun and they make the star look misshapen and doesn't look very pretty basically. And then what happens is that the, so this stage is, is it's a very brief stage. It's only lasts 10 million years, but it's a very significant stage. Now, 10 million years is like 0.1% of the life of a star, which is 10 billion years, right? But it is very unique and very significant. Right? So it's called out by scientists as, as such. And then it transitions into what is called the main sequence star or the mature star that we see in the skies today. And so it continues to reduce in size. And when it continues to reduce in size because of gravity, what happens is that the temperature and pressure in the core increase and it initiates nuclear fusion in the core. And so hydrogen nuclei in the core fuse to form helium nuclei and they release energy. So it's a fusion reaction that releases energy. And this is a chain reaction. So when the energy is released, it causes other hydrogen nuclei to fuse and so on and so forth. So a tremendous amount of energy is released. And a couple of things happen, right, at this stage. The sun becomes stable, right? So what happens is that because a lot of energy is being re released at the core, it causes this ball of gas to expand. The heat causes the ball of gas to expand. And the gravitation causes the ball of gas to contract. So at some point in time, these two forces can become in some kind of dynamic equilibrium and they, they come into balance. And so you have actually what is quite remarkable. The sun is basically a ball of fire. It's almost a perfectly spherical ball of fire just suspended in space. And it's because of this, this, uh, this combination of two forces that you see that it is so perfectly spherical. And the other thing is because it is much smaller in size now, it, there is a significant reduction in the flares that come out of the sun. Right? So, so if you summarize this, the current sun is smaller, it is less bright, and it is more spherical than the juvenile T Tauri star that we saw in the previous slide. Let's see what the Mahabharata says about it, right? And uh, there is a story about the transformation of the sun in the Mahabharata, and it is the story of the marriage of Samjna and Vivaswat. And this is how it starts. It says, uh, Vivaswat's wife was the goddess Samjana, the daughter of Swastri. And it says, the sun god Martanda blazed in his own energy, and this burnt her body, and she did not wish to approach near. And this is from the Harivamsa. The translation is by Dev Roy. So this is a fairly long um, passage. It's a passage of about 35 different verses. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. So Samjana is this newly married wife. She's married the sun god, uh, Vivaswat, and she can't go near him. So she's understandably very unhappy and disappointed. And after a while, she says, okay, this is not working for me. So she said, decides to go back to her father's house. And um, she leaves behind in her place an image of herself called Chaya, right? So she leaves Chaya behind with herself uh, in, her, in her place, and she goes off to her father's house. And her father greets her warmly, but after a time he says, well, you know, it's not nice for, it's not good dharma for a daughter to stay for a long time at her father's place after marriage. I suggest you go back and resolve your differences with your husband. Now, um, at this stage, and uh, um, Samjana does not know what to do because he's so bright and so, um, so difficult to live with. 
So she decides to do prayer and penance. So she goes into the forest and starts praying, right, for uh, uh, for help from the gods, basically. And um, so initially, Bhivaswat doesn't realize she's gone away, but after a while, he does. And when he finds out, he was understandably quite upset. So he rushes to her father's house and says, well, where's my wife, where's your daughter? And Vishwakarman says, well, she came here some time back and uh, I sent her away, sent her back. And uh, my suggestion to you is that you are too very bright and you should probably reduce your brightness. So the son goes into meditation and, and figures out where his wife is. And he finds out that she's in the forest of Uttarakuru and she is meditating. She is uh, performing penance praying that her husband is less bright and easier to live with, right? So that's where the, um, that's where the story is. And I'm going to pick it up from here and look at some of the worst. And so, um, and so when this happens, when, uh, when this Martanda realizes or Vivaswat realizes that his wife is praying for him to be easy, mellower and easier to live with, he decides to take up Vishwakarman's Twastri's offer. And he says, Twastri, please go ahead and reduce my size. And then the, so this is an amazing story. This is a story that's kind of hard to believe that it really exists, but this is how it is. And so um, the verse goes, Twastri approached Martanda Vivaswan, raised him on a wheel and began to slice, began to slice off his energy. And when his energy was sliced away, his form became resplendent. He became more and more handsome and seemed to be even more beautiful, right? So this is from the translation by Devroy. So the same story is there in the Brahmanda Purana and in the Markandeya Purana, but it has some very interesting more details that I think uh, I, that I'd like to share. So the same passage in the Brahmanda Purana starts out by saying, originally the form of Vivaswan was so refulgent that the rays spread sidewards as well as upwards and downwards. So well, I've highlighted these. So I want you to re recollect what was in the Tauri star, which had the, the jets of gas that were coming out, right? So it almost um, specifically, uh, very directly um, refer, um, describes uh, what is there. Then again, I'd say the gentle lady Sabdina was afflicted by the form of the sun, a lot of firmament and the sun. Then again, he says, uh, same thing, he says, he placed him on a circular moving wheel and pruned the slices of the irregular parts of his brilliance, right? So what is the irregular parts of his brilliance? The part that are coming out, the flares that are coming out, right? So he prunes that out and takes it away. And then he says, when his refulgence was taken away, the sun had his brilliance uprooted, i.e. reduced, right? So again, very similar. And then the Markandeya Purana has a very specific verse which says, and after all this reduction, he says, and therefore the adorable Lord bears only a 16th part. So the, um, so the sun was reduced to 1 16th of its original size, so depending upon whether you uh, look at it in two dimensions or three, di three dimensions, it's a pretty dramatic reduction in the size of the sun. So if you look at the summary of the text, you see the young sun is extremely bright. It is active and it is misshapen, not very nice to look at. And uh, after marriage to Samjana, he becomes mature, right? Like we expect most young people, most young men to become after marriage. They, we expect them to be very mature. And the sun is transformed in three ways. It is reduced in size, it is made less bright, and it is made more circular. That means the flares and the irregular parts are removed. And this is ex very close to what is suggested by modern science. So the story seems very strange, right? On the, on just on the face of it, it's like, why are we discussing something like this about the reduction in the size of the sun? But when you compare it to what exactly modern science says, this is surprisingly similar. So let's move on, right? Let's move to the next stage, which is the stage of the, uh, oh, sorry. Then there is another uh, part from the Varaha Purana. And the Varaha Purana does not have the story of Samjana and Vivaswan, right? In this, the sun is prayed, the sun is very bright and he's prayed to by the devas and then he reduces his brightness. And this is how the prayer goes. And the, the prayer starts by saying, you're the firstborn in the world, you protect the world and also destroy it at the time of deluge. When you rise, you enliven the whole universe, we always bow to you. So I've underlined the words, destroy it at the time of deluge. And this is not something that we normally associate with the sun. And so we'll come back to this later. And I just want you to keep this at the back of your mind. And then it says, when it was thus extolled by the devas, the sun assumed the gentle form. So the sun becomes gentler. It, does, it is no longer as active. And then he says, it was in the Tithi Saptami that the sun became embodied. That means 
the sun became its current form in the skies today on the tithi saptami right so the saptami tithi is important here and then there is another verse this time from the skanda purana about the origin of the sun and it says the rada saptami so it's not just any saptami falls on the seventh lunar day of magha when for the first time the sun got into his cherry at the beginning of the manvantara the sun got into his cherry so uh, the seventh lunar day of Mag- magha the month of magha is january to february and the seventh lunar day is the the saptami in that month and in the south of india it's called rada saptami right so the sun gets into his chariot so the uh, chariot is ratha and so it's rada saptami and on rada saptami day there are you know prayers to the sun god sometimes this, um, an image of the sun god is taken around um, in a chariot profe- procession if it's a temple town if it's a small temple down they'll do something like that in the in the uh, in, in in the town itself but in the north of india there is um sun worship is more more common is or much more common and so people uh, celebrated as surya jayanti the day of the birth of the sun and they light lamps and they uh, they have a dip in the ganga or whatever holy river that they have nearby so if you stand back and look at this entire entire thing that you see you can draw a straight line from the science of the sun right from the how it from the from a theta wing star becomes a mature main sequence star to a very to a simple annual ritual that is Uh, performed by ordinary people that have no knowledge and have probably no interest in the science of the sun right but this knowledge has been encapsulated in in this festival of saptami in the surya jayanti and in the rada, rada saptami and it is kept alive through the process of ritual in um, in india so I, i thought that was um, that was quite fascinating yeah so then we move to the uh the current stage which is the mature stage and uh, I, i don't want to spend much time on this because basically the puranas repeat what we already know it the text describes the sun its distance its speed its size and so on um but they also describe the water cycle and um so we all know the water cycle you know the water evaporates in the ocean it goes up into the forms clouds the clouds come over land they you know form rain and the rain goes into rivers and the rivers empty itself into the oceans right so we all know this and we actually taught this in school uh, but this was actually proposed in western science first by a french engineer in the late 16th century and even though he proposed it then it was accepted into modern mainstream science in the early 19th century and it is quite surprising to see um, a fairly detailed description of this both in the mahabharata and the brahmanda and the vayu purana almost a thousand years earlier and I, i i don't want to go into a lot of detail in the interest of time but i just want to call this out here so the next uh, stage the red giant stage and the white dwarf stage and uh, what happens here is that in about 7 billion years from now all the hydrogen gets exhausted so basically all the hydrogen nuclei all the hydrogen gets converted to helium because of fusion and once this happens the sun can produce energy in two ways so all the helium uh, in the core can fuse to form carbon so carbon is the next larger atom than helium so you can have two helium at nuclei fusing to form one nucleus of carbon and again that's a, that causes its own that releases energy and that again continues the chain reaction and then you have hydrogen nuclei in the shell which combine to form helium and so um between these two processes an enormous amount of energy is released and the sun grows enormously in size and becomes what is called the red giant and an example of a red giant in our neighborhood is a star called rohini uh, we'll come back to rohini later and the star rohini or star aldebaran is about is slightly larger than our sun in terms of mass so it has about 16% more mass than our sun but it is 40 times the size of the sun and 400 times brighter so it's really huge right so the same sun same star expands dramatically and it can dr- expand up to 100 times its size so this is hard to comprehend <laughs> and so i have um, i've given some uh, some visuals for this so current solar system is a schematic not necessarily the scale the sun here will be in a similar to the planet and uh, in about 7 billion years when the sun becomes the red giant basically what happens is that it swallows the planets of mercury and venus so you can see the mer- planets of mercury and venus are no longer visible they're inside the sun right 
and the surface of the sun is very close to uh, the earth. So um, uh, this is the schematic of the sun. And uh, as I said, um, you know, you can see the planets of Mercury, the Venus and Earth and so on. And once it becomes a red giant, the sun actually swallows up uh, the planets of Mercury and Venus. It becomes so large and uh, it, the surface of the sun gets right up close to the Earth and heats up the Earth, right? It's on fire, literally, because of how close the sun is. And um, this is not just somebody's imagination, right? So there's been a lot of papers on it, uh, written on this. And in 1987, there was a paper by Goldstein which said that the red giant sun would become so large that it would actually swallow up the Earth itself, right? Not just the sun. And then there was another paper in 93 which said because of um, all the solar flares, the mass of the sun would keep decreasing and, uh, and the planets would, would move to a larger orbit and therefore the Earth would escape. And uh, finally, in, in 2008, there was another paper which said that because of, some, because of another force called the tidal attraction, the Earth would not be able to move out far enough. And at its maximum, the sun would just envelop the Earth. So there's a lot of work that's been done in this area. Again, this is not very easy to, um, to get a sense of. So this is another uh, visual, right? This is an artist's impression of the Earth close to a red giant sun. And it's from Wikipedia. And here you can see the surface of the sun and the earth and the earth is it's just a burnt out ball like there's nothing that you can see on it there's no question of life no oceans no mountains no ice caps nothing at all so there is no semblance of life at all because everything is burnt completely by the sun right and so it's a very terrifying view of the earth but that's that's the current view that is held by by science so let's see what the mahabharata says about it and this is from the vanaparva and uh, here Rishi Markandeya is speaking to Yudhishthira. And so Rishi Markandeya meets with Yudhishthira in the Vana, in the, I think it's the Kamya Kavana. And Yudhishthira asks Markandeya what the, um, how the end of a kalpa is likely to be. And this is what he says. He says, towards the end, a drought comes that lasts for many years. Men and creatures of little strength and vitality die of hunger in their millions. Seven blazing suns appear in the sky and suck up the waters of the earth from the rivers and the seas and all things are reduced to ashes. So this translation is by Menon and it, this is from the Mahabharata, the Banapur. So uh, the Brahmanda Purana and Vayu Purana have a lot more detail on this. And this is uh, from the chapter title, The uh, Dissolution of the Universe. And in both these Puranas, the red giant sun is called the Sambartaka Aditya. Now, the Samvartaka Aditya is a sandhi of two words, Samvartaka, which means annihilation, and Aditya, of course, means sun. And so Samvartaka Aditya is the sun that annihilates the universe, right? So it's very clear what's going on here. And it starts out like this. It says, at the end of a thousand Chaturyugas, when a period of annihilation arrives, of the yugas arrives, the Prajapati begins to make subjects abide in hate. So I've underlined thousand sets of Chaturyugas. A Chaturyuga is 4.32 million years. And so a thousand sets of Chaturyuga is 4.32 billion years, right? So, and then it talks about a continued drought lasting for a hundred years. So to so just think of is when the sun increases in size, the earth becomes hot. And the best way to think about this is like um, global warming on steroids, right? So when we talk about global warming, we talk about a two degree centigrade increase or a three degree centigrade increase. Think of a 20 or a 30 degree centigrade increase in the uh, temperature of the earth, right? And the earth becomes so hot that the clouds cannot form anymore. And so once it's too hot for the clouds to form, there is no question of rain and there is perpetual drought, right? And so when there is, no, when there is continuous drought, uh, the water bodies dry up and, and any plant or animal that uh, relies on water bodies for its survival will die and just become, will get turned into dust. And then it goes on to say, the sun that blazes in the sky, sucking up the water, drinks water from the great ocean and being burned by the brilliant flames. It goes on to say, being burned by the brilliant flames, the earth, including mountains, rivers, oceans, becomes bereft of moisture and viscidity. So um, basically it says that the, initially the, the oceans, uh, the water from the ocean starts to evaporate. And then when it gets really hot, the entire, the oceans become dry, the rivers become dry even the mountains become dry. So even the water that's inside the rocks and the soil evaporates and goes into the, um, into the atmosphere. And then it says, being restrained by those days for the sun that burned brightly, the earth is enveloped entirely beneath, beneath, above, and on all sides. 
And so it actually talks about the rays of the sun completely engulfing the earth, right? Surrounding the earth. And then finally it says, getting the fiery splendor transmitted to it, the entire universe slowly assumes the form of a huge block of iron and shines there. So the image here is that if you leave a, leave a block of iron in a fire and you fan the cold fire, after a period of time, the iron becomes so hot that it begins to glow. And the imagery is that the earth is inside the sun becomes so hot that the earth itself begins to glow. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's pretty chilling in its accuracy and the detail that it is going into. It's not just some strange story that's out there. So, um, so a couple of things, if you look at the summary of the text, uh, there's a couple of things we can call out here. First thing is the timeline is similar to the sun's life. So the sun's life we said is about $7 billion. And so the $4.32 billion is the same order of magnitude as the $7 billion. Uh, the sun starts to heat the earth um, when it grows in size. And initially the drought kills plants and animals. And finally it dries up the oceans and then finally it uh, envelops the earth and the earth begins to glow, right? And uh, this is important. This is a simple description. It's not a story. There is no God or goddess getting married or a sage or a king or anything of that sort, right? There is no alliteration that's required here. There is no inference that is required here. It is how a simple text would describe uh, this, uh, this event, right? So quite, quite amazing. And the sequence of events is very close to what is suggested by modern science. Yeah? Um, so let's move on to the next stage, which is the white dwarf uh, star. And what happens is the core continues to undergo fusion. So we saw the hydrogen forms helium, the helium forms carbon. And then after a while, the carbon um, nuclei can fuse to form the next bigger nucleus, which is oxygen, right? And so it goes on bigger and bigger. And uh, it goes on till the nuclei become so large that they cannot fuse anymore. So if, essentially the nuclear fusion stops. Now, if you recall, we when we talked about nuclear fusion right in the beginning, we said that the heat generated by the nuclear fusion causes the ball of gas to expand, whereas the gravitational force causes the ball of gas to contract. Now, if there's no heat produced, uh, what happens is that the core, right, it collapses dramatically in, in a very short order, and it collapses to form what is called a white dwarf star. And the material in the shell is thrown out as a vast cloud of gas. And so here is a visual of this. And uh, you can see this tiny dot is probably the white dwarf star that you can see in this, on the screen. Right? It's just a very, very tiny amount. It's the half the mass of the sun. The sun is like thousands of times bigger than the Earth. But it's the size of the, it gets reduced to the size of the Earth, literally. And then you have the cloud of gas around it. But more importantly, what happens is that the sun's surface is now very far away. Right. So when the sun was huge, it's, uh, it had become so big that the surface had come close to the earth and it enveloped the earth. And now when the sun collapses, it's very far away from the, the surface of the sun is very far away from the earth. And more importantly, it's not producing any heat. Right. And so what happens is that the planet start, this is, this, this happens very quickly on a cosmic scale that is right. And the planet starts to cool rapidly and the atmospheric water vapor starts to condense and it creates huge clouds and it forms continuous rain. Now, this rain is very far removed from our everyday experience, right? So let me, let me give some context around this so you can get your head around this. So imagine you have the earth, you have all the water in the oceans have evaporated, all the water in the oceans, in the lakes, in the rivers, ponds, in the underground aquifers, everything has evaporated and gone into the, into the atmosphere. Then you have the water in glaciers, in at the snow caps of mountains, you have icebergs, you have the polar ice caps. All of those have also melted, uh, evaporated, and gone into the atmosphere. And then you have the water that's in the in the rocks, in the soil. Every, every last molecule of water that is somewhere in the crust of the Earth evaporates and uh, goes into the atmosphere. And when the planet starts to cool, this entire mass of water forms gigantic clouds, and then and they form rain, right? And um, let's see what the texts have to say about it. So I'm going to go straight to the uh, Vayu Purana. Um, there are, so the Mahabharata has the Bharat Parva, which has a continuation in very concise form of what's going on. But I, in the interest of time, I'll go straight to the Puranas here. And so this is from the Vayu Purana. And then it says, thereafter, the terrible Sambartaka clouds begin to rise in the sky. They assume the shape of herds of huge elephants and are embellished with lightning streaks. 
The clouds then shower energetically and quell the entire inauspicious and terrible fire. So remember, the, the atmosphere is getting cold, right? Because it's no longer heated by the sun, but the earth is still red hot practically, right? You saw, you saw it in the, uh, in the visual there. And so when the rain falls, it may not even get as close to the earth. It may not even hit the earth before it evaporates and goes back up again. So the first thing that the rain has to do is to quell the fires on the surface of the earth. It has to cool the earth. And then it goes on to say, when in a course of a hundred years, the whole fire is quelled, uh, the clouds um, that arise from the fire inundate the entire universe with huge quantities of showers. So it says basically that now that the earth is cool enough, the waters can stay on the surface of the earth and they stay on the surface of the earth to form giant oceans, right? So there's an enormous amount of water that comes out as rain onto the surface of the earth and forms a giant ocean. And then it says, then the oceans overflow their shores all around, mountains crumble down and the earth sinks into the water. And in that Ekarna, the big, vast, single vast sheet of water, all mobile and immobile beings get dissolved. When a thousand cycles of yugas passes away, it is called a complete kalpa. And so um, this is the pralaya. This is the pralaya at the end of a kalpa. And the, the result of the pralaya is the single vast sheet of water that, uh, that kind of almost um, submerges everything, not almost, actually submerges everything. And it is, it is called ekarnava because eka is one and arnava means ocean or water. So it's the single vast amount of water that covers completely everything at the end of a kalpa. And so remember in the, in the Varaha Purana phrase, we, the words we saw, you, um, you destroy the entire universe in the deluge at the end of time. And this is that, this is that deluge at the end of uh, a kalpa that the sun destroys the um, universe. So um, let's 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 kind of get things together. So if you look at the Itihasa Purana and the life and the life of the sun, you have signs that describes the birth of the sun as having five stages: the birth, the young star, the mature star, the red giant, and the white dwarf. And quite surprisingly, the Itihasa Purana talks about each of these stages. It talks about the birth of Martan, like the birth of the sun, as an inert star that emits neither heat nor light. It talks about Vivaswan as being extremely bright as a young star with rays extending in all directions. It talks about the mature sun where the, with the, where the brightness and the size are reduced and the flaring is reduced. It talks about the description of, of, of the water cycle. It talks about the red giant sun, the Samvartaka Aditya sun, and which in its maximum makes the earth glow. And then it talks about the white dwarf where the earth is submerged and the Samvartaka clouds and rain submerge the earth. And uh, this is over a kalpa of 4.32 billion years, which is about the timeline of, um, of, our, uh, of, of the life cycle of the sun, similar timeline. And this is an astonishing level of detail that correlates well with modern science. So um, I'm going to let that sink in for a couple of moments before we move to our next section, which is the story of the moon. So the story, um, so I'm going to share some stories of the moon in a similar fashion, and I'm going to only provide an overview because firstly, the stories of the moon uh, is a much more complex story, right? And even if you do have the same complexity as the sun, we just don't have the time to go into that level of detail, right? So, I, but I want to make sure I give you an overview of the stories of the sun, of the moon, so that you have a sense for what the Puranas and the Mahabharata also talks about. So a quick introduction to the sun, the, uh, uh, to the moon. The moon is the queen of the night sky, and it is one of the kind in the solar system. So many planets in our solar system have moons or what we call a natural satellite. Um, and there are 200 such moons, over 200, actually over 250 such moons in our solar system. But, but all of them are less than 6% of the size of their host planet. So if there's a moon orbiting around the planet, it's generally less than 6%, the size of that um, moon is less is less than six percent of the size of the host planet of the planet that it's orbiting, and actually more than two thirds are less than one percent size. So they're really tiny, right, compared to their host planet. Our moon is a whopping twenty nine percent the size of the Earth, right? So it's not like six percent or seven percent. It's a it's like almost a third of the size of the Earth, right? It's almost the size of a small small planet uh, like Mercury. So the question that arises is. How did the moon, how on earth did the earth get to have such a large moon, right? How did the moon form? And um, now the origin of, 
of the moon is a is a field of study all by itself, right? And but the most widely accepted model today is called the giant impact hypothesis. And I'm just going to give you a quick flyby of this hypothesis, right? Just with a few uh, clicks. So uh, we know that there are eight um, planets in our solar system today, but the primordial solar system, so billions of years ago, had uh, many more planets. They had, the planets were smaller, and then the, over a period of time, the planets kind of bump into each other and become bigger and so on, right? So one such planet was a protoplanet called Theia, a protoplanet the size of Mars. So this is a hypothesis, right? This is a hypothesis. And the scientists, for the purpose of, the, for the purpose of their of this hypothesis, they called it Theia, which is the Greek goddess, which I believe is the mother of the moon or, or something like that. I'm not, I'm not very clear about that. So this planet Theia also orbited the sun, but it orbited closer to the sun, whereas the earth orbited further away from the sun, right? But um, what happens is that the, the planets also um, kind of exert a force on the other planets. So for example, a small planet like Theia, because of other planet, large planets like Jupiter and Saturn gets attracted by it and turns out it moved into a slightly larger orbit and it got into the, got very close to the orbit of the Earth, right? So that's what happened. And uh, what happened is there was a collision and this collision, you can, and it was just a glancing blow, right? But you can imagine this is at the celestial scale. So this, these two planets actually, the primordial earth and the primordial moon, proto-moon, collided with each other. And you can imagine the enormous amount of heat that would have created, right? So it would have practically melted parts of the earth and uh, a lot of the debris would have, would have been thrown out. And when the, when the earth kind of, after the melting or something, when it stopped, it would reform again and it would become spherical again. And the dust would be would be in a debris disk around the around the around the earth at that time right so it would create a large disk of debris and this is very similar i mean you can think of the rings of saturn if you want to think of a, of something to imagine this as right but this is a very large disk of debris that is around the earth and then over a period of time what happens is that the particles of dust in this in this disk of dust they start attract attracting towards each other and through a process of accretion, they form what they form the moon, right? And this is not very different. It's like, remember that at the, in the primordial solar system, that there was a sun and there was a disk of gas. And it is from these disk, the disk of gas first becomes rings. And then these rings become planets, right? Because the dust and the rings get closer to each other and they become planets, right? And so the earth and the other planets were formed this way and the moon was formed this way around the moon, around the earth. So this in brief is the hypothesis, right? So this is where it's at. So let's see what the uh, texts say about the, uh, about the moon. So the texts say that the moon was born of Atri, right? And um, you can call it Rishi Atri, or you can call it the star Atri, right? And the star um, Atri is one of the Sapta Rishis, which is also an astronomical, which is the Great Bear constellation. And the star Atri is the same as the star Megres, which is the part of the Great Bear constellation, right? So the Mahabharata says um, Atri had a son called Soma, the moon, and then it describes other things about Soma, which is not of interest to us. And in the Brahmanda Purana, there's a verse which says the Lord, uh, the lordly sage Atri became the father of the moon or Brahmanas. When the 10 ladies were unable to hold the fetus, the moon fell down to earth. So, so a couple of things I want to call out. First thing is that it talks about the moon falling down to earth, okay, very clearly. And why should it fall down? Because the, the subtle issues or the Great Bear constellation is, in the, uh, is very close to the pole star. So it's in the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, it's in the, in the Northern sky. So when you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you have to look up to see the, uh, to see the constellation, the Great Bear constellation and the star Atri. And this moon was born out of the star Atri and came towards the earth. So that's what it says. And when it talks about the 10 ladies unable to hold that fetus, basically the 10 ladies are the four cardinal directions, so the north, east, west, south, the four ordinal directions, north, east, south, east, north, west, south, west, and then the direction up and the direction down. So basically when these various directions are not able to, so when, when it talks about a fetus, it talks basically about a, 
like a coronal mass ejection, right? So when this ejection ex escapes the gravitational pull of the star, it just goes out into space, basically, right? And it fell down and it came towards the Earth. So this much is very clear from this verse. So the other aspect of the moon is that the moon is um, married to the nakshatras, it's married to the 27 nakshatras or the 27 daughters of Daksha. So let's see what the text say about it. It says, um, the Brahmanda Purana says, Daksha, the son of Prachetas, gave in marriage to the moon that his 27, uh, 27 Dakshainis or daughters of Daksha of great uh, holy rites, whom they know as the stars. So you can see a couple of things here. You can see um, you can see the moon as being personified as Soma. You can see the nakshatras being personified as Dakshayani. You can see Atri as being personified as the star Atri as being personified as the Rishi Atri. So remember, it's a very simple way of talking about this to an audience about a thousand years ago, right? Even today, we can have a talk discussion about astronomy. Two thousand years ago. These Mahabharata was supposed to be read by ordinary people, right? And so for an ordinary person to think about astronomical terms, the best way to communicate this knowledge is in the form of simple story. So, and everything is being personified, right? So that's the context. And the Mahabharata is an, almost an identical verse, which I'm not going in in the interest of time. So the question is, why does the moon have need to have 27 wives? Why can't he just have one wife or maybe just a handful of wives if he really wants you know, to have many wives? So the first question is, why does, he, why does he need 27 wives? Why does he need 27 nakshatras? And the 27 nakshatras are the 27 stars or asterisks, right? So, um, and, the, and it is derived from the lunar month. So the duration of a sidereal lunar month is 27.3 days. And so the moon orbits the earth every 27.3 days and 27 is the nearest whole number. So when the earth um, rotates around its axis, uh, you will see the moon rise in the sky, just like you see the sun rise in the sky during the day, you'll see the moon rise in the sky because of the rotation of the earth. But because the moon is orbiting the earth, you will see the moon rise in a different place every day. It'll, it'll move by 127th of the circumference of a circle so that after 27 days, you'll come and see it back in the same position, right? And these are the 27 tithis that, that you have. And so basically, um, the ancient astronomers divided the sky into 27 parts and they had stars in each of these places to mark. And so on, at dawn or at night, the sun would be seen close to a different star. And uh, because the moon spends the night with that star, the moon is said to be married to the star, right? Because you have personified the moon as Soma and personified the star as Nakshatra as uh, Dakshayani. If you tell the story, you have to marry them together because that is Dharma. You can't just have people you know, spending nights with each other without marrying each other. So that's how, um, that's, the 20, that's the story of the 20, 27 Nakshatras. But it gets a little more complicated, right? We know from this, many of us may be familiar with the story where Rohini, the star, was the favorite of the moon, right? And the moon actually ignored the other wives in favor of Rohini. So here is the words from the Mahabharata. It says, the most beautiful was Rohini and an enraptured Soma lived exclusively with her. So again, the story is not of the moon being next to a star, but, of, but the Soma living next to, uh, living with that nakshatra. So it, everything is personified here, you can see. And one more thing, it says the most beautiful. So why is it the most beautiful? Because of the 27 nakshatras, the only red giant is Rohini. So it is the brightest of all the stars that you see. So again, very consistent in its description, right? And then the Kalika Purana says, uh, Soma served Rohini alone and enjoyed pleasure only with her. In fact, without Rohini, he was not content even for a moment in the past. And this is from the Kalika Purana. Now, the Kalika Purana is an Upa Purana. It's not a Maha Purana. Uh, but it is, and the difference between an Upa Purana and a Maha Purana is that uh, Maha Purana has what is called Panchalakshana, which is the, the five aspects of, of a Purana, all of which may not be present in an Upa Purana because it is meant, it is more story based and meant more for, for, um, for ordinary folks basically to, to follow. 
but it is fascinating because it has two full chapters, almost 200 verses on the, on the moon. So it has an enormous amount of detail about the moon. So it's a very good reference text for the moon, basically. So how is this possible, right? Uh, the moon, uh, so the stars and constellations also move, but because they are billions of kilometers away, they are stationary from when seen from the earth, right? They, you don't see them move uh, physically in, uh, in angular direction. But the moon is, or if the moon is always clo close to a star, that means that sounds infeasible because the moon is much closer, right? It can't, um, even a small movement in the moon should be able to be visible directly from the earth. And so it's only possible if the moon, if the moon can only be a single place in the sky is only possible if the moon is actually headed towards the earth. And we, talk, we saw this being mentioned in the verse in the Brahmanda Purana, where he says that they fell down towards the earth, right? And it has to be approaching the earth from the direction of the star Rohini. That's why it will always, so when you look at the moon in the sky, you'll always see the star Rohini in the background and the earth and the moon is approaching the earth, right? And the verses from the Kalika Purana speak to this pretty directly. And I'll share some of these verses now. And uh, this, is in, uh, this is in the context of the Purana, the Sthala Purana of uh, Chandrabhaga, the mountain and the river. So there is a mountain Chandrabhaga in the Western Himalayas. And there's a river as well of the Chandrabhaga. And this talks about the story of Chandrabhaga. And it says, the Brahma, the progenitor with the lotus seed and the past for the welfare of the worlds, divided the pure moon Chandra on that mountain. Since Chandra was divided in the mountain in the past, the gods named it Chandrabhaga, the place where the moon was divided. So it actually says that the moon impacted the this mountain and and broke into pieces into more than one piece basically right and that's why the mountain is called chandrabhaga because it the moon became into pieces as a result of this and the mountain itself broke right obviously it says the lord of the night chandra by tearing open that mountain by the head of his uh, club on the western edge caused the water flowing so there was a and thus out of that big mountain emerged the river chandrabhaga which is equal to the ganga in merit so even today, from the Chandra from the Chandrabhaga mountain, you have the you have actually there is a small lake which overflows, and there are two rivers called Chandra and Bhaga which join to form the Chandrabhaga uh, river, right? And so, not only was the moon broken up, the mountain was also broken up. So remember, this is described in very simple terms for the for the audience of its time, right? And then um, the moon is actually. Uh, turned into dust. So it says um, Chandra. And so there's actually a lot of detail that is there that I'm not going into. And then, then it says Chandra came out in the form of a powder, right? And then Brahma threw all of that, the powder and everything else that came out into the sea of Shiroda and passed and departed quickly. So basically the moon um, impacts the earth that becomes this powder and Brahma or the force of nature puts all this powder into the sea of Chiroda. Right? And this is Kalika Purana chapter 21. One other thing, this is described in the Kalika Purana as having happened before the Swarochisa Mantra. And so it's almost about 2 billion years earlier, right? So, so pretty close to that. So if you look at the summary of this part of the text, you see the moon has become a part. So the moon is born of the star Atri about 2 billion years ago. It is headed towards the earth. It impacts the earth, it breaks up and turns into dust. And this dust goes into the Kshiro, the Sagara, which is a region of space around the earth. And this is just as modern science would have it. Right? This is exactly the sequence of events that you see in a modern scientific description. So um, we have a summary of what follows in the Varaha Purana, and it's a part of a more detailed narrative. And you have a similar set of verses in the Mahabharata. And so because of the because the sun, moon breaks up, there is very little of the moon left, right? And so, um, so the gods think, oh, the moon has almost disappeared. So they run to Brahma and said, hey, the moon is gone. You know, we need some help. So they told him that Soma was lost because of the curse of Daksha. And then Vishnu suggested that they may churn the ocean. And after telling the dev, after telling the after telling devas thus, Vishnu mentally recalled Rudra and Brahma and also the serpent Vasuki for the churning rope. They all churned the ocean and Soma reappeared. So very brief. I mean, this is probably one of the shortest versions of the story that I that I found. And this is the Varaha Purana in chapter 35. Now, uh, the Kalika Purana has obviously a little more detail. And um, in, the, in the Kalika Purana, in this, Brahma is talking to 
the moon, right? What is left of the moon, basically, right? And, he, and Brahma says, whatever quantum from your body remains in the Chiro, the Sagra, we shall take it out from the sea by churning it. After we pick up from the sea, which we shall churn, you shall regain your, uh, your form and uh, original shape, right? And so this is in the Kalika Purana, chapter 21. And then we have a similar verse in the uh, Skanda Purana. And it says, um, the Skanda Purana is a Mahapurana, is the longest Mahapurana, almost 80,000 verses. And it says, um, it starts out by saying, the Devas finished worshipping the son of Shankara and went to the milk ocean, went to the milk ocean once again. So Shankara is Shiva and the son of Shankara is Ganesha. So they pray to Ganesha that their uh, churning of the milk ocean should be successful. And then it goes on to say, when the ocean was being churned, it was the moon that came out at the outset for the purpose of realizing the objectives of all the devas. So the devas objective was to, of churning was to get the moon out. And that objective is realized when the, when the churning is done and the moon comes out. Right? So that's what the Skanda Purana says. And so again, once again, summarizing what, what we see on this side, we see the churning causes the moon to reappear from the Chiro, the Sagara. And so the moon reappears from the dust from the collision that got into the, uh, uh, dust from the collision that got into the Kshiro, the Sagara. And this is the really interesting part. The churning, it sounds like a strange reason. What, how do you churn an ocean? But churning is the perfect analogy for this. For example, when you put milk or yogurt in a vessel and, uh, and you churn it, it produces butter, right? But the churning does not create any butter. The fat molecules are already dispersed in the milk, right? And what churning does, it actually just brings those molecules of fat together, forms a lump of butter, which kind of floats up to the top. And, and what happens to the moon is almost identical, right? So the, uh, so the, the, the re region of space is churned um, in a sense. And what happens is that all the particles of dust that are dispersed all over this region of space are actually brought together and form a lump like a lump of butter, they form a lump of celestial body, and that celestial body is the moon. And that is exactly as modern science would have it. That is an amazing alignment again. Now, when we talk about the um, when we talk about the Sagar Mantan, uh, or uh, we talk about the churning of the ocean, we talk about it as Samudra Mantan, or we talk about it as Amrit Mantan. So, what happened to the Amrit? So um, here is a illustration from the uh, from Wikipedia, right? And here the ocean is being churned, and this is Mount Mandara, and these are the asuras and the devas. But you can see a lot of things coming out from the as a result of the churning. So obviously you have the moon right on top here. Uh, you have cows to the jewel, the jewels that come out. You have uh, the wish fulfilling cow Kamadenu. You have. Um, you have the horse Uchai Sravas, you have Lakshmi that comes out as a, as a part of the churning, you have um, the elephant Airavat, uh, you have Parijat tree that comes out, and um, you have um, finally you have Dhanvantri that comes out with a pot of uh, Amrit. And you know that beautiful story of how uh, the uh, Asura snatched away the pot of Amrit and then Vishnu assumes the form of Mohini. So, another very beautiful story that I don't have the time to do it. So if you look at if you look at a summary of the whole thing, you have the science talking about the the birth of the birth of the proto moon, right? Not the moon. You have the which is the moon, which is the planet uh, proto planet Theia. You have the collision. You have the debris disk that is formed around it, and you have the moon forming from the debris disk. And the Itihasa Purana talks about exactly the same thing. It talks about the proto moon born from the star Atri and that heads towards the earth, it collides and turns into dust. And then that dust is mingled with the Kshiro the Sagara, which is a region of space around the earth. And when this region of space is churned, um, the moon emerges from it. And um, this is, an, and again, this is at the same time span. This is a few billion is order of magnitude of time before in the, in pr prior to uh, present time, like in billions of years, as suggested by modern science. And this is an astonishing level of detail, right? That correlates well with modern science. So uh, just a few closing remarks before I uh, finish. So the Itihasa Purana um, is, a, um, is a storehouse of knowledge, right? Uh, and there are many stories and descriptions. Uh, so there's a lot more detail about the moon. 
and there is extraterrestrial origin of the Earth's water. So the scientist, scientist community are now very clear that the early Earth, the primordial Earth, was just too hot to have water on its surface. So all the water in the oceans and the rivers has to have come from outer space. And when you look at all the stories of the descent of the Ganga and the various Puranas and the Mahabharata, and you put them together, you can understand how they describe the origin of water, the Earth's waters from outer space. And the texts talk about the Earth's shape, size, and geography, the spherical Earth, not just the flat Earth. It talks about events in the Earth history, Earth's history. It talks about the solar system and the neighboring universe, right? And the adjacent universe. And the book that I've written recently explores these and many other Puranic stories and puts them in a context of science so that we can better understand what is being communicated here. So like I said, the texts are a storehouse of knowledge and uh, these are not just stories. So, we, so the Puranas often get just talked about as a large collection of mythology or Mahabharata is just a struggle between, between the brothers, between cousin brothers, Kauravas and Pandavas. Um, in reality, these stories and passages transmit knowledge and they transmit more than just dharma, knowledge of dharma or religious instruction like how to perform a yagya or so on. And they, the, the stories correlate well with science, right? And so, and when I say they correlate well with science, I'm not talking about medieval science. I'm not talking about um, the Pythagoras theory or, or the Fibonacci series or something like that. I'm talking about cutting edge science really, right? So the red si giant sun was first understood 50 years back. We didn't even have a knowledge of the red, science, uh, red giant sun more than, um, let's say, 100 years ago. And the Puranic passages are similar to the most recent paper. So even though we understood it 50 years back, we had an incomplete understanding. And it's when we look at the papers of 2008, they match well with what is in the Puranas, right? The origin of the moon is not yet settled science. So the scientific community is in broad agreement on the red giant sun and so on and so forth. But the origin of the moon is not settled science. I shared with you the giant effect hypothesis. Unfortunately, what the situation there is that the hypothesis, though it fits most of the observed data, does not fit all of the observed data, right? And so other scientists have proposed variants to this hypothesis to kind of fit some of the other things that have been observed. What is interesting is that the Puranic narrative is a nuanced version of all these various hypotheses, right? Amazing, right? And here's what I wanted. Um, I want to close this part with it. Say, I, you know, if you, if this this is a two thousand year old text, or you know pick your number. But if this text had been uh, read, let's say, 100 years earlier, it would have been just considered to be ima poet's imagination, right? And if you are favorably disp disposed towards the text, then you would say, well, these are very charming and lovely stories. And if you are unfavorably uh, disposed towards these texts, you would say, well, you know, I don't know why people read this and believe this, because this is the source of all superstition, right? The reality is neither of that. The reality is because they read it 100 years ago, the science of that time had not caught up with the with what is written in the Puranas, right? And it's today, as we have a better understanding of some of these phenomena, we are able to correlate. And I'm sure that as um, the cosmology is a very young science, as, as we make more progress in cosmology, there is a lot, even in the Puranas and cosmology, that's not obvious to us. And I'm sure it will, uh, we will understand a lot more about the Puranas as we make more progress in science. And so, um, so the, the Purana, the texts contain a wealth of detail about the cosmos, but the cosmology, and so we need scholars, we need more cosmologists. I'm not a, I'm not a practicing cosmologist. I was interested in cosmology and so kind of I taught myself this whole thing. And so cosmology is a small part of the text, and, um, but there are many other sciences as well. And the scholars have excellent translations in English. So there is a board of scholar translation. There are other translations of individual Puranas by individuals, by other scholars. And I want to call out the work of Sri Debroy. He has taken upon himself the trans task of translating all the Puranas. And so he's already translated the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And he's translated, I think, the Bhagavata Purana, the Brahmanda Purana, and the Markandeya Purana. And he's working his way. So a monumental task that he has set for himself. But we need scholars of other disciplines as well. We need scholars from disciplines, from medicine and music, and from architecture to astronomy, so that they can engage with the text and unlock this treasure in the Itihasa Purana that was given to us by Maharishi Vyasa. So with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and for your time.
Uh, if you don't mind, sir, I have actually two questions, if I may. Uh, so two questions and I will very briefly. So uh, right up front, I'm not a person of science, sir. I uh, gave up science after 10th standard, but I found it really <laughs> fascinating. So I must say, uh, very humble questions for me, but it's an area of interest. When you explain simply, it's put simply across to people, it really is fascinating. Right. So uh, one question of mine, sir, is since you are in this field and you've written a book as well, are uh, what we have in our history, <coughs> what you explained in the Itihasa Purana, has that been taken up by any um, any scientist in the Western world? Because everyone looks to the West for this. Has this been taken up, analyzed, to study the history of the moon, which you said is still under debate? That's one. Has us been looked at, you know, seriously as a source of knowledge? And the second one is out of my own interest in astrology. So my second question is actually in our astrology, in our Jyotish, we give the status of planets to sun and moon, actually. So I just want to know what are your views on that with regard to because you have that's that we don't give them a status of like star and this and that. they both are planets and and uh, we give them the status. So just two questions. Yes. Thank you. So uh, so two things. First thing is your first question is has it been done by the West? So um, it's useful to think of the world in this form. Right? There are people that read the Puranas and there are people that do science and people that do science don't believe in the Puranas at all. And the people that read the Puranas don't believe in science or are not trained to understand science at all. So it's like a, the intersection set is a null set. And so um, I so, so I, I keep asking myself, why am I the first person to figure this out? <laughs> I mean, I'm, right, there's been humanity for centuries before me. And I my the only answer that I can have is because that because of this uh, the sense that you know um, we you know, because these are two science and, and the Puranas or our ancient texts are two completely different words and they don't seem to kind of come together at all. And uh, that is my request at the end of at the end of this discussion that we need to bring them together. These are not, we thought these were different words, right? That was our first understanding. That has been an understanding since I grew up. Right? So I, I don't want to kind of put anybody else in a, in a, in a stand. We all think of it this way. But I started reading the Puranas about 10 years ago and about, and so you read the first Purana and you think it's a very nice story, you read the second Purana, you think it's a very nice story, you read the third Purana, and what happens is that many stories start getting repeated, right, the story of the sun, the story of the moon starts getting repeated, and each Purana repeats it slightly differently, so it adds a little detail, uh, some detail, and so if you, if you, and I was, I was reading this like, the, the world was going to come to an end, right? I was just reading one Purana, I would finish it and go to the next Purana and finish it. I don't know what came over me and I still enjoy reading it. I haven't read anything else since then. So, um, so when you read four or five Puranas and read the same story four or five times, you suddenly realize that for the four or five times that you've read the story and you put all the detail together and you suddenly stand back and say, my God, this, this is not just a nice story. There's a lot more that's going on here. So I doubt there will be a scientist that will read five Puranas. Just I, so my my intent through the book and through the through talks like this is to try and get this knowledge out and say, hey guys, you know there is there is more to the Puranas than or even the Mahabharata, right? Forget the Puran. Nobody reads the Puranas. Forget about reading the Puran. People people don't even print the Puranas because somebody has to buy it, right? So nobody buys it. So nobody prints it even. So I had to download these PDFs from the web and print it out myself and then read them, right? That was my story. But nobody, you know, you, nobody buys these Puranas anymore. But the, but the Mahabharata is read. Everybody knows the Mahabharata. But even in the Mahabharata, we only focus about the story of the Kauravas and the Pandavas. There is so many lectures and talks and so on. They only focus on this and there is no time that is spent on the ancillary stories. And so the purpose of the book and the stock is to open up this discussion saying, guys, we need scientists to come and look at. I'm not a trained cosmologist. I just kind of taught myself cosmology, right? I was interested and I, I've had an interest since I was in school. But I'm sure if there was a good cosmologist that got to take, take a look at it, they might find much more than I could find, right? So that is one part of the question and the answer is no. And my intent is to, through this, through such events is to try and reach out to as many people as I can. And to your second question on astrology is that, so it's a planet because 
anything that orbits the that is seen going around the earth is defined as a planet right so i don't know if you're so especially in the southern part of india um you have the nine box um on uh you, when you do the jyotishi you have this nine box uh system that you make a notation of right where you have the earth in the center and then you have uh the various the 12 lag, uh, 12 box uh, the 12 12 lagnas around it and so basically you have all these the sun the moon and the five planets and rahu and ketu they just move around in those in these 12 boxes actually you might be surprised to know that the 12 box system is actually a representation of the sky at any point in time so if you if, you, if i'm you, you know so if you can actually say that you know you cast a horoscope when they were born and you draw the nine boxes you actually look at the sky at that point in time you'll find the moon in that in that in the direction of this constellation you'll find the sun in the direction of the constellation so just because they orbit around they are seen orbiting around the earth they are called planets even in the puranas they are defined the sun especially as a very special place and then the moon also has it as a different place amongst the nine planets so i'm not an expert in astrology but from what i what i've read uh, i thought i should share with you and i write about the part that the this 12 box thing um i read, write about it in the book and i give it a little more detail around it because in the north of india you have nine boxes but not in a circle but it's in a it's in a different format right and it has a different um, it has a different use it's a tool and it's a different use so I, I i don't know if i answered your question but that's the best i can yeah, I so said just one more question with regard to the dating uh, that you mentioned. So we go with the assumption now that Mahabharat is about 5,000 years ago. Right. That's what is the accepted version. So where does that fit into this timeline that you have uh, presented of the Itihasa Purana and all? Is there a confusion there or is it all at so, the same no. time? So uh, it's a very easy question to answer or a very difficult question depending upon how you want to frame it, right? Um, so if you say, so if you say the Mahabharata text is about the Mahabharata war, then we say that the Mahabharata war was about 5,000 years ago. And I, and I'm not an expert on this, but that seems to be the broad consensus, right? And if some people say it's a few hundred years here or there, there are actually some people that put it earlier or later. To that. I mean, there's a range of people, but the, probably the greatest number are around 5,000 years. So that's the, that's the easy part. Now, if the Mahabharata is talking about the birth of the sun, where did that story come from? Right? I've not been asked about the Mahabharata, but I've been asked about Puranas, right? And which and I, you know, I've uh, I've tried to put some thing together on this, right? So let's just take a quick look at this. So this is a verse from the Brahmanda Purana. And it talks, of, so again, the same story is for the Puranas, right? If the, we say the Puranas are 1,500 years old or whatever years old, right? But if they talk about the birth of the sun and the, how the sun got transformed into the current mature sun, then these events happened a couple of billion years ago. So how do you date something that talks about a billion years ago, right? So in the Brahmanda Purana, it says, by means of narratives and subsidiary narratives, folk songs, utterances from the Kalpa text, which is, I suppose, the Kalpa Sutras, Vyasa, who was an expert in the meaning of the Puranas, composed the Purana Samhita. So they, he very clearly says, I didn't make up these stories. These are from, the origin of this is elsewhere, through these you know, uh, folk songs and other narratives, older stories that came down to him. Okay? Now, when you date a text, right, like the Mahabharata or the Puranas, right, you, you, the event itself is the lower bound, right? So if, you're, if it's a story about the Mahabharata war, you can't have a text about the Mahabharata war before the Mahabharata war. So you say, okay, the Mahabharata war is about 5,000 years old, so obviously the text was written sometime later. Or if it's the Roman Empire, then you can't have something about the Roman Empire before the Roman Empire was founded, right? So, and then you do what is called a ladder of references. So basically, you say that um, the text re refers to this document, which was written at this time. And this, so if it is refers to this document, then it was after this document, the, this other document refers to this text. So it was before and so on and so forth, right? So you create this linkage between these various texts and say, therefore, we think that this Mahabharata or the Puranas was written in this period, 
right? And it requires a lot of scholarship. But this assumes that the Purana or the Mahabharata is just a story. It just assumes it's a collection of stories. But if we have, if they have the birth of the sun, then how do we date it, right? How do we date? So that means it just says it's some previous story. So what is the date of the previous story, right? So I think we need to look at the, we can look at it very simply saying, well, the Mahabharata was 5,000 years old. But if you look at the total amount of information in the Mahabharata text, you have to stand back and wonder where all this information came from, right? And so if there is information about how the sun dies, which is like 7 billion years in future. How did this information come by? So these are not easy questions to answer. And I, I just wanted to give you a sense for how, how you can frame this question in many different ways and come to completely different answers, right? So I don't have an answer for you, to be honest, but um, I just at least wanted you to get a sense for, and then, you know, there's, um, there's a lovely phrase in lovely words in the Brahmanda Purana, which says also in the Vayu Purana similarly says, hence listen to this summary, Narayana creates this world. It is on that occasion of creation where he makes this entire Purana. It does not remain at the time of annihilation. So basically he says the Purana along with the Vedas were created at the beginning of creation, right? Because that, that's how you, because Purana is a Smriti. What is a Smriti? A smriti is something that is recollected. That means somebody has to, it has to be in somebody's mind to be able to recollect it, right? And so whose mind was it in? There was nobody there four billion years ago. So you, you asked a very simple question, but it, it can easily telescope into a, into a monster you know, if you're not careful. So just wanted to give you a sense for how complicated that question can be, you know, as you approach it. But I agree with you, the 5,000 years is the most commonly understood dating for the war itself. Right? And the text is assumed to be written around the same time, so around the same time.